Hello. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. As Jack said, my name is Daisy Robinson. I'm a scientist at Harvard University studying stem cell biology at the intersection of embryonic development and cancer. And today I'm going to tell you about a subject I'm deeply passionate about. And to begin this story, I will start with a personal story of my sister Lily and I. This is a photograph of us when we were younger. And when I was about five years old, my sister Lily was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is also called juvenile diabetes. It typically is diagnosed in children. And what happens is your body attacks the beta cells that produce insulin and regulate your blood sugar. Now, after she was diagnosed, um, I remember a lot of things very vividly from that time. We had slept in adjoining bedrooms, slept, separated by a glass door. And this door quickly became a window into a type of life that I'd previously had no concept of. I remember my dad coming in every night at 3 in the morning. He would walk over to her bed, softly wake her up, and gently coax her to prick her finger to test her blood sugar. Now, Lily hated needles, and so there would be lots of tears, lots of crying, uh, and it would seem like hours before the task would actually be done. But what I remember particularly well were the few terrifying nights that Lily crashed and her blood sugar dropped precipitously low, causing her to pass out, and prompting my dad to furiously rub glucose into her gums to revive her. She would come to upset, crying, and confused. Needless to say, this was one of the most deeply moving experiences of my life. And it really sparked my passion for science, and specifically for translational research that would advance therapeutic options for people like Lily. And I'm sure many of you in the audience can think of a, somebody that you care for or love who struggled with a difficult disease and you want to do what you can to help. Well, this was sort of my story of going into science. Now, in the early 2000s, there was this rise of excitement about stem cell biology. Stem cell biology. It's really when we started learning more about it and really being able to understand stem cells and what they do. And when I began my training at Harvard, uh, I really focused on the genetics that underlie stem cell identity. And I was researching specifically a genetic program, which is essentially a collection of genes that work in concert to execute a particular task. And this particular task that I studied was stem cell identity, stem cell maintenance. And we found that actually this program was very important in embryonic development which is shown here in photographs I took. This is mouse embryonic development from nine and a half days after fertilization through to 15 and a half. And what was fascinating was the same program that was important in stem cells was very important in the transitions uh, in various organs in the body during embryonic development. But it also was linked to body size, height, and timing of puberty in humans. And shortly thereafter, we found that it's actually reactivated in roughly 15% of human tumors. And so for several years, I studied this, how these embryonic programs are actually contributing to cancer at the worst stages of disease. And it was at this time that I first began to appreciate how fundamental principles of biology can give us deeper insights into diseases that we encounter later in life, like cancer and like diabetes. Oops, sorry, one more thing. Genes and their activity and their regulation they are governing the transition between each of these steps. And they can create these beautiful, highly intricate organisms, or they can wreak havoc in the blink of an eye. And to put this into context, we have a panel here showing all the chromosomes in humans. And each colorful dot next to that is a different sequence variant that's associated with a trait or disease. We know there are roughly 6,000 diseases that are caused by mutations in the genes. And yet, of these, 95% have no approved therapy. So this is a huge field of opportunity. And what's really exciting is that we've had this rise in sequencing technology. You can see on the left a couple of the publications from the Human Genome Project. But we've also seen a dramatic reduction in the cost to do this sequencing. And so we've had this rise of genomic data that's facilitating our ability to discover and our ability to know what's happening. Because we know that we have all these colorful dots showing the variance of sequence. We don't know what they actually do. We don't know if they're contributing to the, disease, to the disease or if they're just a casual bystander that happens to be associated with a particular trait. And in order to get at this, we've harvested research tools from natural diversity. 
In particular, I'm going to talk about CRISPR, which is a gene editing tool that's been harnessed over the last couple of years to really facilitate and transform the way that we do biology and the way that we understand disease and even form treatment options. Now, CRISPR was discovered in the early 2000s by some scientists working at a yogurt company. And being scientists working at a yogurt company, they wanted to know everything that they could about a bacteria called Streptococcus thermophilus, which was a workhorse of the yogurt and cheese industry. So they sequenced the genome of these bacteria. They wanted to see all the genes and what they do and wondered whether they could make them more efficient to produce the product that they're looking for. And what they found was that in the genome of these organisms, there were these little bits of DNA that looked like they were from viruses. And what they came to find was that many of these bacteria had what we now call CRISPR. And this functioned essentially as a form of adaptive immunity. So what would happen is you have bacteria in their environment, the virus would come and infect them, and then little bits of the viral DNA would get integrated into the genome of these bacteria and serve as a history of the infection of that bacteria. So that any time the same virus would come back, they would know, okay, I've seen this, it's bad, I need to chomp up that DNA so that it won't cause me to die. And when researchers started really understanding how this worked, we realized that we could actually harness this to look for specific types of DNA in any type of organism. So what we're looking at here on the left-hand side is the naturally occurring CRISPR that was described in this bacteria. And you can see on the left, there's those elements called protospacer, they're colorful little bands. Those were the bits of viral DNA that would integrate. And you can see that there was all this other machinery that would be required to assemble to create this CRISPR-Cas complex that's up here on the left. And that would be guided by those little viral bits of DNA to find and chomp any other viral DNA that matched it in the cell. Now on the right is the most commonly used engineered system that we use in the lab all over the world every day. And you can immediately appreciate it's much more simple. Now what's beautiful about this is we've sort of packaged all these different elements into a simple molecule we call a guide RNA or gRNA. And it's modular. And the only bit that you ever need to change out is that green segment there, which is a string of nucleic acid letters, so DNA letters, that's only 20 in length. So if you remember our panel of the 6,000 gene variants up there, we know what the sequence is. We can just hone in on a 20 letter sequence within that, and now we're able to target that specifically to understand what's going on with that gene, whether it's functionally relevant in disease. We can do this in cells, we can do this in animals. It's really amazing, and CRISPR has really transformed our ability to understand the function of genes. So much so that CRISPR was named the discovery of the year in 2015 by Science Magazine. We've already used it in a wide array of organisms. We've used it to generate virus-resistant animals. We've used it to make more resilient crops. We've even talked about using it to bring back the woolly mammoth, or probably more appropriately, take genes from the woolly mammoth that enabled it to be cold resistant and place them in elephants that are facing extinction today. And what's really amazing is that we've already used it in humans. Because CRISPR has enabled us to assign function to so many more genes, we've been able to learn much more about disease, but we're actually moving into a therapeutic application of this technology. So how are we moving forward with the actual gene editing of humans? Well, there are labs all over the world that are studying different uh, tissue systems to understand diseases using CRISPR, but also to see if we can apply this as a therapeutic approach. Uh, and each of these tissues has a different set of indications that go with it, from the eye and retinopathies to the liver, like hemophilia that was mentioned earlier. And these all group into one of two categories, in vivo or ex vivo. We'll start with ex vivo, That's, that means outside the body. And we start here because it's something that we've actually been doing for decades. We know how to take blood cells out of a patient. We know how to harvest immune cells and put them back to treat, to treat patients with different diseases. And all that we really need to do is layer gene editing on top of that, and that's what's being done currently. So what's happening is we're taking blood cells out of a patient, we harvest the immune cells from that specifically, and then we can do genome editing on these cells. We can manipulate them, to tinker with them, to generate characteristics that we'd like to see. You might think, okay, what do we want to see in these cells? What would we want to do? 
Well, the cells don't really like being taken out of the body and put back in. And so one of the things that we've been using gene editing for is to make these cells more resilient so that when you place them back in the body, they survive better, they persist, they're able to function well. They're able to lend their immune function to a patient who's just undergone radiation therapy. Another more exciting application of this is you can actually change the character of these cells so that they can go into any patient, removing the need for a match. One of the biggest challenges for many patients is finding a match so that when you, so that you have a donor that actually matches you and you won't reject the cells. But you can actually edit these cells now so that you can have an off-the-shelf off uh, cellular replacement therapy, which is pretty unbelievable. And in fact, this is happening. Uh, the first clinical trial is happening in humans in West China. Uh, the first patient has already received uh, the CRISPR therapeutic. They removed cells from this person. They did a genome modification of these cells and put them back in. I believe they're scheduled to do a second infusion. And I believe they're also enrolling nine additional patients that are starting soon. Um, unfortunately, we don't know a whole lot more about it, but it's happening. CRISPR is in humans, which is very cool. It's paving the way. But more exciting for me is the in vivo piece. That means in the body. Um, certainly ex vivo is super exciting and there's a lot that we can do with it, but there's many diseases that are in organs within the body that are difficult to access and, and you know, we can't really do anything about that. We can't take them out and put them back in. You can't take the lungs out and put them back in. So understanding how to approach these tissues inside the body is going to revolutionize our ability to treat diseases that have no other options. Um, now, some of these will be more easier than others. We have the eye and the liver. I mean, your eyes right here. Your liver, you can access readily via circulation. Others are much more difficult, like the lungs. You take cystic fibrosis, for example, um, and you get this buildup of mucus in the lungs, and that is very difficult to penetrate. So many labs all over the world are working hard on delivery methods to penetrate structures like that, but also to target specific cell types. You think of muscular dystrophy as an example. Well, one approach that some groups are taking is to generate a virus that infects specifically muscle cells. So you can administer the therapy systemically to the whole body, but it hones in only on the cells that actually need the edit to make a difference. But needless to say, CRISPR technology has really revolutionized both our ability to understand disease and is starting to revolutionize our ability to treat disease. And this becomes really exciting as we look forward to the future. What will it mean when CRISPR becomes a regular part of our health regimen? Right now, we're still facing a lot of obstacles about delivery, about safety, and those are very important considerations. But in the next 10 and 20 years, it will become more commonplace. And I can readily imagine a day when a visit to the doctor will lead to a referral to a gene surgeon who will sequence my DNA and create a medicine that's specific to me and specific to my pain or my disease. I can also imagine a future where, as part of our childhood checkups, we have staged treatments where we're having CRISPR therapies or gene therapies to prevent diseases before they ever become symptomatic. And if this were the case, perhaps we could have caught that my sister Lily was susceptible to post-viral autoimmunity, and we could have saved her from a lot of stress and heartache. And this is what's really exciting about CRISPR, is that not only can we create new treatments for diseases that there aren't really any options for, but we can actually prevent anybody from having symptoms in the first place. If you can tell, if you know that you're gonna succumb to a particular disease, wouldn't you wanna stop it before it starts taking you down? And that's some of the beauty here. But then it gets a little more tricky because we start thinking about, okay, when we really refine this technology, aren't people gonna to wanna to use it for things beyond their health? Of course, it's easy to imagine somebody that we love who's suffering, doing anything that we can in our power to help them. But then what about human enhancement? If you could choose for your child to have 20-20 vision, barring some sort of accident, would you? What if you could enhance their empathy, their athletic ability and physical strength? These are questions that we're going to have to have a conversation about, that we're gonna to have to answer because there will be a day in the not too distant future when this will be possible. And it's also interesting to consider not only you know, changing different traits in ourselves or maybe our children, but changing traits in the germline, which would be inherited by future generations. Now, there was a report released recently by the National Academies that talks about heritable and non-heritable genome mutations. 
Uh, and currently, the heritable genome mutations is banned in the U.S. and many other countries. Um, but certainly, there will be a day when it comes to pass, I think starting with very severe diseases, preventing those from being passed on. But these are things that we need to talk about, both as scientists, as the public, as governments, because they, they will change the way that we approach healthcare. They will change our culture, they'll change society. And it's important that as we move forward, our visions of technology, of creativity, of design, that they're married with compassion and humanity. Thank you.